Hello, my name is Sonia Weinset, and this is another episode of Filmmaker Focus. We have with us today Jeff Kerr, writer, producer, and director of the documentary Great White Open Ocean. Great White Open Ocean is a film that follows the story of expert shark diver Jimmy Partington, who in 2020 nearly died in the jaws of a great white. A year later, Jimmy looks to overcome his PTSD by getting back in the water with the ocean's mega sharks. But what begins as a triumph unexpectedly becomes a battle between life and death when Jimmy suffers a massive stroke. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Sonia. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about this film. It's an incredible survival story, but it's also probably the most spectacular film sequence in Shark Week history. But before we get into the film, Jeff, let's talk a little bit about you. You've been filming sharks for over 30 years. What got you interested in sharks? Well, like everybody else, uh, I was scared out of the water by the movie Jaws. And so I had this weird fascination sort of a love-hate thing going with sharks. But as I started working on Shark Week, and I wasn't a diver when I started, I was basically just an editor, I became more and more fascinated with sharks as I learned more about them. And a lot of the science and things we know about sharks uh, back when I started was in its infancy. And um, the more I learned, the more I became interested in the sharks. I became a diver, I got in the water with them, I got up close and personal with you know great whites, tiger sharks great hammerheads, all the big uh, Shark Week stars. And um, and that really hooked me. And that was, you know, 32 years ago, 32 seasons of Shark Week. And I'm still hooked. I love these animals. Uh, I love spending time with them. And it seems like every time I do a shoot uh, with sharks, I'm learning something new or we're capturing another new behavior. And that's what keeps it interesting for me. What was the initial spark for the documentary? Close friend of mine and uh, Shark Week uh, regular Jimmy Partington, who I've worked with on a lot of films in the past, he and I wanted to find uh, great whites in a place where they've never been actually filmed before, and that was uh, way offshore in the middle of the Pacific. So we went out there uh, looking for sharks, and uh, Jimmy wanted to uh, observe these sharks up close and, uh, and personal, and we decided to use a, a clear... Uh, polycarbonate cage to observe the sharks, which is actually better than a metal cage because metal cages have uh, interesting effects on the shark's sensory system. So we use this clear plastic cage and a massive great white, probably 16 feet in length, maybe three, 4,000 pounds, got really interested in Jimmy as he was floating in this, in this cage. Right below you, right below you. Oh, that's a great shot. Oh, there's a shark here. They like my feet. They like it. It's exactly where he went for. They're staying deep, and they're coming up and hitting. Just keep calling them out, you know? I've already had two bumps now that have been pretty deliberate. They look like they're getting a little bit more fired up. What was that? It was a close encounter, something that I've never seen in 32 years. I still, you know, get goosebumps when I think about what happened, but uh, just an incredible encounter with that white shark and Jimmy showing us his skill in the water to be able to survive it. At the top of the film, Jimmy talks about his close calls with sharks, but says that these are acceptable risks when working with such large predators. Do you agree with Jimmy that the risks are worth um, taking when you're trying to push the boundaries of shark knowledge? Well, we have to always manage the risks, and we do so by understanding the behavior of the sharks and understanding also that every shark is different. Um, there's things you can do with one particular great white that you wouldn't dare try with another great white. And it's a matter of just years and years of being on the ocean and being in contact with these animals and understanding their, you know, their behaviors and the subtle cues that they give off, um, which you can definitely discern one animal from the next. And people think all these sharks are exactly alike, but that couldn't be further from the truth. They have their own individual personalities. And some of them you can work with 
the thing about Jimmy is he's willing to put himself out there to get close to these animals, to learn more about them. And somebody has to do that because you can't learn about sharks in a, in a laboratory all the time. You have to get out there and, and, and be with the animals. And that's what Jimmy does. That's his specialty. That you talked about these subtle cues, you know, sharks give. Um, in this particular case, uh, do you feel the shark gave several warnings before the breach? Can you talk about what some of these signs were? It was very interesting to see the shark. At first, very cautious, circling Jimmy in the plastic box, getting closer and closer. And sharks, great whites, even though they're the, a big animal, uh, top of the food chain next to orcas, uh, they are very cautious about things that they you know, don't often see. So I'm sure this was an object that uh, was uh, of concern to the shark. It wasn't sure, is, is this gonna cause me harm? The way that sharks investigate things is they, they like to touch things, bump things. We hear from people who are attacked often that they were bumped first by the shark. They didn't know what it was. A lot of times you can't see the shark, but they'll come in and bump you and touch you to see what you are. And I think that was the case in this sequence where the shark got closer and closer, started bumping and bumping. And when it felt like the box was something that it could handle or maybe prey upon or whatever its motivation was, it went right for it. Uh, incredible impact. Uh, the box, as you see in the film, was shattered. And thankfully, uh, Jimmy was able to sort of ride on what was left of the box away from the shark's jaws. Uh, the shark, meanwhile, probably didn't know what happened. It just moved off. And thankfully, it wasn't injured in any way. Jimmy wasn't injured in any way. But, whew, boy, that was a close call. And we were all just sweating bullets. I, I think people said I went completely white when that happened. I was like frozen because what can you do? I mean, all you can do is watch and, and count on Jimmy to get himself out of that mess. It was a year before Jimmy got a chance to get back in the water after the attack. Can you talk about that first dive at Edwards Island in New Zealand? It was a lot of flights, ferry rides just to get there. And uh, once we got there, um, I got a chance to, you know, talk with Jimmy quite a bit, and he was very anxious to get back in the water. Uh, he felt like it was time, you know, to confront his this this fear that had been building up in him, and that was unlike Jimmy because he loves these animals. He's been working with them for you know well over a decade, and uh, felt very comfortable with the with the sharks. But all this time away from them, you know, it builds up anxiety. I know what I have to do. I have to get back in the saddle. I've got to get close to these animals again and reaffirm in my own mind that they're not malicious and that they're not out to get me. Yeah. Good luck in there, Jimbo. Nice to hit. Have fun. I have to do this if I ever hope to work with great whites again. in about 22 feet of water and the dive plan was for Jimmy to go down about 10 feet, get acclimated to the sharks and to the cage, and then when he was ready, he'd go down to the bottom. Hey, Jimmy, is your valve closed? All right, cool.
So I know he was really anxious to get in the water and uh, a little nervous for sure because the sharks in New Zealand are, are, they're no joke. I mean, they are big, aggressive, great whites. The day that he went in the water, we had about 10 big sharks around. So just looking over the side of the boat, you're like, oh, I'm gonna go in there. A lot of the Shark Week hosts I brought down there, they can't believe when they see what, what goes on in the waters of New Zealand. But Jimmy was gung-ho, he was excited. I could see that, maybe a little nervous. And we dropped him down in the cage. And at first, I think it took him a minute to kind of adjust. He hadn't been in the water for a year. And then all of a sudden, when the first shark came in, he, he just sort of became Jimmy again. Describing the action, the sharks coming in close, approaching the other uh, the other cage, approaching him, and I felt like immediately all that anxiety and if he had PTSD, that just all washed away. We all were really excited uh, by the dive that he had. It was an incredible dive. In the film, Jimmy calls the great whites opportunistic animals. Can you explain what he meant? Well, opportunistic uh, in terms of a great white shark is an animal that will take advantage of any situation uh, that it can. And that's something that it's learned through thousands and thousands of years of evolution and relying on its instincts. So what a white shark will do, I've noticed this myself being in the water with them. If you're looking this way, the white shark always seems to come in from the other direction, from, from this direction. And then if you look at it, it moves off. So it seems like wherever you're not looking, the white shark comes in behind you. It's, it's interesting how they try to ambush you, but that's the way they would approach their normal prey, which would be a, a seal. They try to sneak up on it, they're ambush predators. And so when they see an opportunity, like someone that has their back to them, they're gonna come in close. Uh, I know divers, in fact, that will paint little eyeballs on the back of their masks, uh, on the back of their head, because they don't want the sharks to sneak up on them. Uh, it's really interesting how the sharks can tell if you're looking at you, you know, looking at them or not. So um, they are opportunistic. They do want to try to get any kind of advantage uh, when it comes to something they encounter in the water. Can they sneak up on it? Can they surprise it? Can they ambush it? And you saw in the film that um, one shark in particular got very close to one of the cameramen, and I don't think the cameraman even noticed because he was so focused on getting the shot. The shark was like really inches away from him. And luckily, for some reason, the shark turned away at the last second. Jimmy decides after the dive that he wants to try snout touching. Um, do you think he was testing himself? Yeah, I think Jimmy felt like he had a lot to prove because he'd been out of the water for so long. And I think his signature thing, his ultimate thing, the thing that he's known for around the world is his ability to, to handle these animals. And he's done snout touching before, so the sharks in New Zealand are very interactive and he thought, here's my chance to do this again. Getting a bit more toothy here. Heads up, buddy, I see him coming up right now. Okay, I got him, I got him. It's amazing how they come up to the back of the boat and they just come rising up like they're looking at you. Okay, he's gonna be good. Not every single shark is gonna allow you this type of interaction. For a nice, slow animal, a relaxed shark, 
one that's going to allow me to interact with it safely and respectfully. It's all about just getting the right shark. I felt like this brought him fully back. This was this was the Jimmy I knew from, you know, a year before, and uh, he was really excited, pumped up. Um, and he did an amazing job and he, he always does it with great respect and reverence for the animals. He tries to, um, you know, educate people about these sharks when he's doing these things. And that really gets people's attention. It's like, you know, you always want to save things that you love. And Jimmy has this love for sharks that I think, uh, other people pick up on and they in turn become more interested and eventually will love the sharks too. So this is an example of of him demonstrating this behavior. It's a spectacular thing when the sharks come up and their jaws drop open. It's just a great way to showcase the beauty of the and, and the mystery of these animals. And one of the uh, things that was mentioned was that it's the, it was the same shark that pushed up against the Black Widow. Is it unusual or, you know, you talked about the different personalities of the of the sharks, how they're not all alike. And even Jimmy talks about, you know, um, the importance of like figuring out which shark is open to snout touching. Yeah, that particular shark, that was really weird. The fact that the one that we could easily identify because he had these things called copepods on his back. I've seen them on the chins of sharks. It almost looks like a goatee, but there's these little creatures that take a ride on the back of sharks. And that particular shark, for some reason, who knows why, was really into Jimmy. It's like he followed Jimmy around. This is a magnificent shark. I've seen that happen before with other animals too. And I've dove with manta rays and the manta rays are really smart animals. They'll, they say they have the intelligence of a house cat. And I've had manta rays follow me around on a dive, like just sort of single me out wherever I went. In fact, I got back on the boat and a manta ray came up in, to the back of the boat and waited for me till I got back in the water again. I jumped back in the water, it followed me around more. So you see that with these sea creatures and people take them, you know, take their intelligence for granted. They think, ah, fish, they're not that smart. But um, we see this in the manas, we see this in great whites. Uh, for whatever reason, that one particular shark really had a lot of interest in Jimmy and interacting where other sharks are gonna be shy, they're not gonna wanna get close. But one particular shark connected with him in some way, and I thought that was an interesting thing to, to focus on in the film. But this is just a remarkable shark. It's, it's obviously comfortable with what I'm doing. It's at, at any point, this shark could swim away. So it's just as curious of me as I am of it. Wow. It's just reminded me exactly why I have so much love and respect for these sharks. Can you talk about the morning Jimmy had his stroke? The stroke just took us all by surprise and, and really devastated us. Um, it just came out of the blue. It was completely unexpected. Uh, you know, we had such had such a great day the day before. Jimmy basically completing his comeback. Uh, he was feeling good. We had you know fun that night. We were playing video games and and everything seemed great. And we were starting out our day the next day, getting ready to go back out to sea. And uh, as I say in the film, I noticed that Jimmy just seemed really kind of off. And I, I couldn't really put my finger on what was going on. So um, he, um, you know, we, we were just leaving the dock and he came up to me and thank God we were close to shore, but he came up to me and said, I can't talk. I didn't really understand what that, it just didn't really register what he, what he was saying, but he just had this look in his eye that made me scared. Uh, and um, he said it again and I said, this something's really, really wrong. So I had the captain of the boat turn around and head back to the dock. And I said, call the paramedics. And they had a helicopter there because I knew it was something bad. I, I didn't know, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I, you know, I have had relatives that have had strokes before, kind of recognized some of the symptoms. And I thought, 
you know, we got just have to get him to a, a, a stroke center hospital as quickly as, as possible. There's not a lot you can do until you get someone that's having a stroke to a hospital. Thank God we had a medevac there, got him in and flew him up to Christchurch, which has this unbelievable stroke facility there. And there was a lot of hours there where we didn't know what, if he was going to live or die. I flew up there with him, dropped everything I was doing and jumped in the helicopter. And he had friends in New Zealand, but, you know, I was there to support him 100% all, all the way. Uh, and I, we stayed with him in the hospital for a few days. And despite the fact that he had, had a stroke, he was remarkably um, upbeat. And I got the sense that um, he knew it was going to be a long recovery. It's, uh, how do I describe it? We got your dives done. Yeah, we were lucky. And there was a great dive. There's a lot of sharks. You did well. You did well having that one. Yeah. Because we had none the. Yeah. And then you did the snout touching. Which yeah. Was great. That would yeah. mean. I think. I think that would be honestly. Those sharks were just chill. I just think that would be massive. Yeah. I think it beautifully done. Yeah. We quiet. Like, everyone was quiet. Yeah. Did you notice? Yeah, I did. Everyone was like quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've never gone through anything like that in, in all my years of, of filmmaking, where one minute somebody's fine and the next minute, you know, that happens, especially a young guy like Jimmy, you just don't expect it. And it must have been incredibly difficult for you because Jimmy's not just a colleague. I mean, you guys are uh, friends, right? Have been friends for a really long time. Yeah, I actually... Um, I don't know if the right word, discovered Jimmy. Uh, back in 2014, when I was filming a, an episode of Air Jaws, he was uh, a deckhand on the boat. And I was just uh, blown away by his knowledge of sharks and his enthusiasm for sharks. And I thought this guy would be really good as talent because he's a good looking guy, obviously. And uh, he's great on camera. He has a lot of charisma. So I put him in that first film. Right, you know, right then and there, I put him in the film, and um, we've done collaborated on nine films together. He's done some amazing work, uh, had some unbelievable encounters. He's just a natural on camera, and he's he's got that thing that um, very few people have. You can't teach it, but he can work with sharks, with these you know work with these animals like very few people in the world can actually pull off, and he's comfortable with it, and he he has a way of of sharing his his passion for the animals with the audience that I think people pick up on and connect with. So, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's just a one in a million guy, great friend of mine. Um, you know, uh, in between films, we talk all the time, he'd come out and visit. And so we, we spent a lot of time together and, uh, I look forward to seeing him out as he's supposedly he's going to come out to California pretty soon to visit. So I look forward to that. And how were you forced to pivot um, in making this film after Jimmy's stroke, I mean, the creative had to slightly change, correct? Yeah, I think, you know, the film would originally was probably going to end in, in New Zealand, and that would have been, you know, Jimmy's comeback. Uh, but, you know, a twist like this, um, obviously you can't predict that. So I filmed some stuff with him in the hospital, but that was mainly to send back to his relatives to show me he's okay, he's going to live. And and then we, you know, we started watching that footage. Like, this is really compelling stuff. I mean, this is an unbelievable story. And uh, in consulting with um, my colleagues at Discovery, there, they said you really should try to include this part of the story in the film. So we've expanded the film to include that, uh, the stroke part, and then his, you know, his rehab and recovery. And hopefully, it, like I said, I hopefully it inspires uh, other stroke victims to to see Jimmy's struggle and his passion for sharks and his desire to overcome uh, this, this huge, you know, physical setback. Brandon called Jimmy's opportunity to observe sharks in Guadalupe in 2017 as his defining moment. Can you talk about the decision to include this footage in the documentary? I think one of the best sequences that I've ever been a part of in Shark Week was in, in the film Great White Abyss. And that's where we went down to the bottom of uh, the ocean at Guadalupe Island, which had really never been done before in these little submarines. And Jimmy's turn in the submarine was, it was just incredible. He had 
probably 20, 15 foot plus great white sharks circling him in that submarine and bouncing off the sub. And it, ugh, it was just a, a surreal scene. It looked like the surface of the moon because they're down, I can't remember, it's three, 400 feet. These sharks are so big. They're larger than the submarine. That one's a male right on us. Oh, 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 oh. Right this there. one is really interested in us. Look at this one coming in. Wow, big female. Oh. Huge shark on the sub. Oh, oh she oh, just yeah. hit it with her tail. Oh, she's gaping. Oh my God, she's all over. Oh, hey girl. Oh. Oh, you bumped us. <laughs> These sharks were so active down deep, like they, they're not even close on, to what they do on the surface. A lot of stuff goes on down there and Jimmy was able to see that. He was the first human to see that. And we had, of course, cameras on Jimmy capturing you know, his reaction to that encounter. And it was just amazing stuff. And he talked about how it was the best moment of his life. So I thought that'd be a good emotional way to kind of wrap up the film and, and um, inspire him. Uh, my editor was saying it might like inspire him to even recover faster to see that. Oh yeah. You know, it'll, it'll bring back these memories of, of the, of the very best times of his life. What about you, Jeff? What's the most harrowing encounter you've ever had with a shark? Any close calls? Oh, uh, well, interestingly enough, um, I had a similar thing happen to what happened to Jimmy, except for I had a shark breach about maybe 10 or 15 feet away from me. I was being towed behind a boat on this little metal sled, and I had this shark called Colossus come breaching out of the water right in front of me. It was like a scene out of Free Willy this gigantic belly I'm looking up at, this shark, and it crashed down right in front of me, splashed me. And uh, to this day, that is a moment that I remember every single you know, nuance and every single second, I remember the shark, I'll never forget that. You're just overcome by adrenaline, it's like, oh. And for, I think for a day or two after that happened to me, I was just, you know, uh, uh, I couldn't sleep. I was goosebumps and pins and needles. and. I know I was able to get back in the water again the next day, but Jimmy, you know, he went a whole year. So I'm sure that that um, it plays tricks, you know, tricks on your mind. Like, um, what if this would have happened? What if this would have happened? Thankfully, I mean, I'm glad we were able to get him back in the water again. And um, but there's so many twists and turns in this story that it's it's just wow, what a film! It took a lot out of me making this film. I have to tell you. What makes people like yourself continue putting themselves in dangerous situations despite the risk involved? Uh, I don't, you know, it's just part of working with sharks. I'm, I'm not really sure. It's uh, when you choose to work with, with sharks, bad things can happen. It's, we all know that. Uh, luckily, um, yeah, I work with a really good crew of people I worked with for decades. Uh, and uh, we're always as safe as we can be. Uh, we do know that there's risk involved, but you know some of the stuff we've done has been uh, looking back at. I'm like, ah, man, you know that was that was close. There's a situation that also happened in New Zealand with a friend of mine, Chris Fallows, who was down on the bottom of the of the ocean in this thing called the Wasp, and he was getting hammered by these huge great whites, and they knocked him over, and we lost communication with him. And I was, oh god, but he, you know, he's awesome in the water. The guy's a fish. He's extremely experienced with great whites and you know he managed to pull himself up and he got out of the water and he was fine. And I think it's just, I prefer to work with like the best in the business and Jimmy's the best in the business with sharks. All my other talent, they're extremely experienced and, and that's, you know, that's the way I like to work with people that, that know these sharks because you could be a great experienced cameraman or water person but first time you get in the water and see a great white like all that just goes away you're just like oh my god it's it's jaws in my face so you have to have that in water experience with these animals because there's nothing like being in the water with the great white can you talk about the early days of shark week and how the assignments have evolved over the last 30 plus years yeah you know um Definitely the show content has changed a lot and it's sort of, it's ebbed and flowed. There was, there was years where it was very heavily science oriented. There was years where it was very, very heavily attack oriented, uh, shows about attacks, what causes attacks, things like that. So 
it sort of um, follows popular culture, like what people are into. The important thing about Shark Week, though, that I've seen is when Shark Week started, I think people in general, their only frame of reference for sharks was the movie Jaws. A lot of people hated sharks. They were scared of sharks. Um, and, you know, when Shark Week started in 1988, I think it was probably okay to have a shark tournament, tournament, fishing tournament, hang sharks up on the dock, take pictures, woohoo. Uh, I killed the man eater, but that just doesn't fly anymore. And I always say that I think Shark Week is responsible in part to changing the country's attitude, the world's attitude about sharks and making them the most popular wild animals on earth. Because, you know, if you went and, and took a picture of yourself next to a dead shark and put it on the internet, you know, bad, bad things are going to happen to you. It's uh, people just, they don't like that. They, they love these sharks. And, and, you know, as a youth inspired by Cousteau and reading a lot of his books, and he always talked about, you only want to save the things that you love. And if I always feel like if I can make people love sharks, uh, I don't want to hit them over the head with conservation, conservation. I just showcase these animals. Look at these beautiful creatures. If I can make people love sharks, then they're going to want to save them. And uh, I think I've definitely seen the change that Shark Week has had on on popular culture when it comes to sharks. And it's in, it's actually inspired some politicians to pass bills, stop uh, banning finning of sharks. Uh, it's, it's changed a lot. So I've definitely seen the way people look at sharks, uh, in the last 32 years that I've been working on shark week change, you know, dramatically for the better. And last question, can you talk about how real life can sometimes dictate storytelling in specifically to this documentary and, uh, what happened with Jimmy? Stories like this, Jimmy's story uh, only come along, I think, for me, like once in a lifetime. Um, usually we go out with a, with a rough script of what we want to get, and um, we stick to it as much as we can based on what happens. But as a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, you know, I've always felt like you have to be adaptable and you have to, you know, go with what the cards that you're dealt. And, you know, I've been able to uh, make adjustments on the fly. A great example of that is I went down to South Africa to film an Air Jaws episode. And the day I got there, these two orca named Port and Starboard came cruising into the bay and they killed off all the great whites. And we ended up making a film about, it was called Air Jaws the Hunted. And it was about how the great whites were being wiped out by these, these two orcas. Had I just said, ah, oh, I guess we can't do a film, the great whites are dead, we would have missed out on this incredible story. And same with the, with the Jimmy story. It's, it's just, you know, adapting to the cards that you're dealt and trying to tell a good story uh, and about a friend of mine who I know very well, and it helped that he's a friend of mine because I know, I know him better than uh, like your average relationship between producer and talent. I mean, he's, we're really good friends and I know his passion and I know that, you know, even though right now he's probably not communicating as well as he could, I know what he wants the world to see um, in this film. They want to see his passion for sharks, his, his reverence for the animals, his respect for the animals. And so uh, that's what I'm trying to do is, is in a lot of ways, this film is a tribute to Jimmy and, you know, my friendship with him and respect for him. Well, I definitely think you accomplished all that. I mean, it's it's a very compelling and powerful film, and you know, uh, an homage to Jimmy as well as as you know the the animals that he loves. So um, it was really fantastic, and I can't wait to see the finished product. But uh, thank you so much for coming on, Jeff. It's it's been amazing. Oh, thanks. It was my great pleasure. I I hope uh, people take away uh, a lot of good messages from this documentary and are fascinating. I have a feeling that uh, the world is really going to uh, fall in love more with Jimmy, you know, as a person and see see this guy, because we don't often have that opportunity in Shark Week to really get into the the, the people that are making these films. Um, and this is one rare opportunity that, and I'm thankful to Discovery for allowing me to, indulging me to, to really get into the Jimmy story, which I think is going to hopefully fascinate viewers. <laughs>